Hello everyone, my name is Primitiva. Now let me ask you a question. Did you ever wonder, what if Pokemon could be real? And no, I'm not talking about something like Detective Pikachu. While I do think that the Pokemon in that movie look good, they don't look really real. They look more like animated plushies or CGI monsters. So here's my question. What would Pokemon actually look like in real life? Or rather, what if Pokemon existed in the real world through some type of means? What means, you might ask? Well, the wonderful means of evolution. Evolution, as we know, are small changes in the population biology, which happens over many, many, many generations. These changes happen to help an organism survive and reproduce. Eventually, over time, these changes become more common and individuals who can't keep up simply die due to natural selection. And evolution never stops. Even us, the Homo sapiens, are continuing to evolve with every new generation. A quick example would have to be meat. We can safely consume raw meat, but many animals in the wild can do so without a problem. This is because back in the good old days, we started to cook meat, and through cooking meat, our brains evolved to be much larger, and therefore we got a lot more intelligence. So that's why eating raw meat isn't the best idea. But what if the path of evolution in our world took a completely different path, a more stranger path? So that's what this series is about, analyzing Pokemon their biology, their body plan, and how they live. And with that information, we basically grab an animal that's either extinct or still alive, and we let evolution take a hypothetical path, where this animal will evolve into something that matches the Pokemon as closely as possible. This is called speculative evolution. Unfortunately though, since Pokemon are magical creatures, after all, that means that some might be harder to replicate in real life, while others will be as easy as pie. For example, just look at Toucanon. It's literally just a toucan. But then on the other hand, you have Metagross, which is like, what the heck's going on here? Some kind of weird crustacean? I don't know. The one that I'll be discussing in this episode will be somewhere in the middle. And what better way than to start this series with looking at the first three Pokemon in a national deck, Bulbasaur, Ivysaur, and Venusaur. All evolutionary lines in this series will be linked together as one animal. And yes, that also means that I'll try to make sense of some of their weirder ones, like this mess. I do have to stress though that I'm kind of new to the whole paleontology, biology, and speculative evolution thing or at least talking about it in detail, I try my best to do my research, and I'll try to make everything seem as realistic and plausible as possible, but I'm definitely capable of making mistakes. So if you're an expert on this, and I do happen to make a mistake, just comment down below. I don't mind. I love learning after all. But with that out of the way, let's start. Many people might assume that these Pokemon are based on reptiles because of the sore in their names, which means lizard in Latin, but that is actually not the case. They are stated by the artists to be based on frogs, and while they do seem very frog-like, there is one key biological factor which makes them impossible of being amphibians, and that is their lack of true metamorphosis. While they do change over time, that's just them growing up. After all, you and me, we don't look like babies today. So, if they're not frogs, what are they? Well, they're kind of a mishmash between two animals. They definitely have frog-like characteristics, such as their bumpy skin and the patterns on their skin, and their overall body plan seems to be inspired by frogs as well, but that's really about it. They also have teeth, claws on their feet, ear-like structures, nostrils, and their eyes are in the front of their face. Frogs don't have any of those features. So what is the other animal? Well, I think the animals that come closest are the Dicynodons. What the heck are Dicynodons? I hear you ask. Well, I'll cover that in a bit, but you can see the similarities, right? I mean, the claws, their teeth, their nostrils, the way their legs are positioned. So while this line at first glance may appear to be just based on frogs, you can definitely see the Dicynodon inspiration in there as well. Having their origins out of the way, what does their canonical biology tell us? 
Well, these Pokémon seem to have some type of symbiotic relationship with a plant that resembles the Rafflesia. According to its Pokédex entries, this seed gets planted on its back right after it's born. This is likely done by Venus or Mothers to ensure survival for their Bulbasaur young. These plants give the Pokémon nutrients, nourishment, and energy while they grow. They're also capable of eating, giving them two highly effective ways of survival, which is an amazing adaptation. Although, I don't think they'll be able to just lift off one source. If they could, they likely wouldn't be walking around with freaking plants on their back. They grow together with this plant and develop traits over time, such as stronger legs and a sturdier body, to support the extra weight. Ivysaur's Pokedex entries talk about when the bud starts emitting a nice aroma, that is ready to bloom. And Venusaurus talks about the aroma actually soothing people's emotions, and also attracting other Pokémon. So I'd imagine that these Pokémon are mainly solitary, which makes sense that they are hard to find in the wild, and rarely interacting with each other and just surviving on their own, until the flower fully blooms, and then it attracts other Venusaur. In the anime episode called Bulbasaur's Mysterious Garden, we see a bunch of Bulbasaur in a forest getting ready to evolve into Ivysaur, with a Venusaur helping them through it. But Ash's Bulbasaur resists evolving. I don't think this actually happens in canon, however, I do believe that said Venusaur meet in a place similar to it, and spread the pollen of their flowers along with mating with other Venusaur. The mothers then take care of their babies, plant the flower seeds in their back, and then the babies learn to survive on their own, and the cycle repeats. Well, I think that about covers their canonical biology. It's now time for the next part, the speculative evolution itself. And oh boy, if you thought that this was nerdy, it's about to get even nerdier. Dicynodonts are synapsids, which is a group of animals that includes mammals, like you and me, and basically every other animal that is more closely related to mammals than to birds and reptiles. But they are also theraphsids, which is a group of synapsids which includes mammals and their closely related ancestors. You see the difference? closely related ancestors, and more related to mammals than to birds and reptiles. If you don't know much about paleontology, this might just seem like a confusing mess, but the difference is important. Dicytodonts are known for being one of the few therapsid species which survived the Great Dying, the biggest mass extinction that ever happened at the end of the Permian. This extinction almost put life to a complete stop, but luckily for us, life didn't end. Life, uh, found a way. You see this little critter? That's a Lystrosaurus, a species of Dicynodon. What's awesome about these animals is that in the early Triassic, they were abundant and basically everywhere, and for a while, they were possibly 95% of all terrestrial vertebrates. Why though? Well, lots of possible reasons. Shortage of predators, and of course, it was a generalist, which means that it didn't really stick to one food source. And, uh, well, luck? And it's these animals, that will serve as Venusaur's ancestors. With so many, like literally so many animal species being extinct, it can be hard to pick out the most fitting ancestor. I touched on what a Dicynodon is earlier a bit, but I decided to leave most of the explanation for this part. I chose Lystrosaurus because there were so many of them, and because they were generalists, there could have been a lot of evolutionary potential. Its body type could also evolve into something that resembles Venusaur's. Does this mean that Venusaur will be a mammal? Well, not necessarily. It's impossible to predict what Dicynodons may have evolved into, as no group of animals are just planned, they just happen due to circumstances. Cynodons, another group of Therapsids, did evolve into mammals, but with Dicynodons, well, all we can do is guess. But evolution can be random, luck-based, a toss of a coin. Anything can happen. It just so happened to not happen in our timeline. There's a lot of hurdles to go over, specifically the archosaurs, the reigning group of animals throughout the entire Mesozoic, along with two extinction events, and that's, well, that's always fun. The climate in the Triassic in which they lived was rather dry, because the whole landmass was one big supercontinent called Pangaea, which the archosaurs began to rule in the Triassic. There's many possible explanations as to why they did, such as better lungs more suitable to the drier climate, and my favorite, dry now, before you close this video, please hear me out. Modern archosaurs can, uh, well, excrete their urine as dry paste, which naturally means less water loss. And it's likely that archosaurs back then could do this too, aiding them a lot in their ability to survive in the dry world. So, hooray for pee! But enough about bodily wastes, 
Let's get back to Listro. This little thing needs to survive and diversify. After all, that's the only way it's going to survive in the Triassic. In our hypothetical scenario, Listro will survive to the point where it originally died and evolve to adapt instead. The only species of Listro that will survive, however, are the smaller ones, as it's easier to survive in a world full of big beasts and eventually huge dinosaurs when you're less noticeable. It also needs to evolve better ways of breathing and a way to concentrate its urine to conserve water. Desert mammals can have very concentrated <coughs> urine, so I would say it's possible for our little therapsid to evolve something similar. I think the two niches Lister at first would be best adapted for is burrowing and climbing. Both of these lifestyles are great ways of escaping from predators. I can also imagine its diet changing from herbivorous to more omnivorous by eating bugs. After all, one pound of burger will always give you more energy than a pound of greens, even if said burger is made out of prehistoric bugs. One very important thing for both of these groups to evolve is even smaller bodies and shorter life cycles. Listro actually did this after the great dying, as most of the fossils of the genus got smaller and were younger. Shorter life cycles are helpful, because this means that the animal can breed much quicker. And when you're small along with it, it makes your eggs easier to hide. And yes, it laid eggs. Finally, it also needs to evolve more suitable lungs. Alright, and now it's time for a time skip. Millions of years later, the Lystrosaurus as a genus is still unfortunately dead. But its descendants are well adapted to the Triassic. So, what's next? Well, the end Triassic extinction event. Fun! So, how do you survive an extinction event? Well, there's lots of factors that can help, such as being diverse, small, and just having a lot of you around. But also just, uh, luck? Sometimes you'll still not make it, even if you meet all the perfect criteria. So, in our timeline, the descendants of Lystro survive and make it into the Jurassic period. Not all of them survive, but enough do. So, what's next? Well, simple, evolve and diversify. Early mammals, for example, started to diversify a lot during the Jurassic, we weren't all sure like animals that just ate bugs all day. So our Lister descendants will do the same. Some will be extinct, some won't, but as a group, they'll still exist. Eventually, they'll become so diverse that they'll need to be classified as their own class. You might think that there will be too many classes in the world, but the ecosystem didn't exactly break down when birds or mammals evolved. And having more classes just means that the world will be more diverse. And that's just freaking neat. This class of animals will be known for being Ovoviviparous, and its scientific name will be Triapellus. Triapellus is a combination of words from a Latin sentence, which means energy through yolk. They will keep the egg inside of their body until it hatches, and then the baby just comes out. Except here, they won't have a placental connection with the mother, and instead receive nutrients from the egg yolk. I thought that this would be more fun to do, because, you know, yeah, I could have made another animal that would lay eggs or have a placenta, but I wanted to do something more different, but also realistic. Most would be warm-blooded, but there'd be exceptions, of course. They would share many traits with mammals, such as having hair ranging from a lot to a little, their ears would be mammalian-like and would be similar through convergent evolution, but not function the exact same. Since non-mammalian therapsids were capable of chewing, this class will also chew their food. So yeah, this new class of animals will be similar to mammals, but not actually really mammals. I suppose like how amphibians kind of look like reptiles, this new class will do well and survive through the Mesozoic. They will outcompete various other animals, including some early mammalia forms. And then, before you know it, we're almost at the end of the Cretaceous. Time for another extinction event! Awesome! The new class will obviously survive, and then, after that, it's time for a really awesome phenomenon, which is known as adaptive radiation. I mean, this is basically super evolution. This is where organisms can evolve much quicker because of the newly opened niches. Mammals did this right after the non-avian dinosaurs were wiped out, and evolved into every mammal species we know today in just 66 million years. So our new class of animals will do the same, but that will also mean that some animals we know will just not exist. And through this rapid evolution, our Venus line is getting closer. Don't you worry, it'll be here soon. However, we're gonna need help. 
from one particular genus of plant. This is the Rafflesia, which today grows in the rainforests of South and East Asia. The problem, however, it's hard to find when it first appeared. I looked for hours, and all that I could find is that its family, the Rafflesia CA, probably first appeared in the late Cretaceous. Then later, over the course of 40 million years, they diversified into the big ones we know of today. Flowering plants first appeared during the early Cretaceous, so it seems likely that this is true. The late Cretaceous was 100 million years ago, and since Rafflesia CA diversified over the course of 40 million years, we can assume that they were pretty big 60 million years ago. 60 million years ago seems a bit early though, so let's jump to 45 million years ago instead in the Middle Eocene. Unfortunately, there were no rainforests in Asia around this time, but there was one in Europe, in what is now known as Messel, Germany. This rainforest in particular is known for its amazing preservation of fossils, and it's where I'll be putting the Venusaur line. One problem though, how do we get these plants there? Europe and Asia aren't much connected as they used to be or as they are now, but Eurasia was present in the late Cretaceous. I couldn't find if it was in any other place before it migrated to Asia, so just in case, let's make it down in our timeline, it moved to Europe as well, or instead. After all, the late Cretaceous and the Paleogene that came right after it were both generally warm, just like the Eocene is, so these plants shouldn't have much issue adapting and surviving. So here we are, with some Triapella species living in what is now known as Messel, Germany. The rainforest is gorgeous and filled with all types of animals. One species of Triapellus has adapted itself to living a semi-aquatic lifestyle, similar to a hippo, and it even has a similar body plan to it. And like a hippo, they barely have any hair. They're also darkish brown in color and almost have no tail. These animals get by, but they're noticed a lot, and their only way of self-defense is going into the water, which works, but not always. They also have pretty good eyesight, but they're not that fast. Luckily though, they're social animals, which means that they stick together. Unfortunately though, they're put under a lot of pressure and need to adapt, quick. Good news for them is that they stumble across a lot of Rafflesias, and when they are in bloom, they smell like rotten flesh, which luckily keeps a lot of predators away. Over time, these animals form some sort of symbiotic relationship with the plants, staying with it whenever it blooms for self-defense. But here comes the tricky part. We're gonna have to use some very, very specific evolution to get what we want. First of all, these animals would have to camouflage themselves with green algae. This happens in real life. It grows on some sloth species, which really helps them blend in their environment. So we'll basically just have to replicate that for this. This helps it camouflage with the forest and survive. However, it's not completely green, only where it needs to be. Coming back to the Rafflesia, when it blooms because of its foul smell, various insects like flies come to it and help it pollinate. However, successful pollination is rare because most species are male and female, while a few are hermaphrodites. After a successful pollination, a fruit develops, which is then eaten by many animals, for example, tree-dwelling animals. So if a critter is around when it blooms a lot, it's natural that some seeds will fall onto it. For those who don't know, the Rafflesia is a parasitic plant. It has no stems, leaves, or roots, but instead uses the vines of the tetrastigma plant as host spreading its absorptive organ called the hostroreum inside the tissue of the vines. Yeah, that's pretty messed up. What if we did it to this animal? Since the animal is semi-aquatic, it can provide the Rafflesia with more than enough water to survive. And since these plants are either male or female, they have a hard time breeding and need to get closer to each other. So my hypothesis is that they start to use these animals as hosts because they naturally provide them with a lot of water and can carry them around, meaning more successful pollination. And because the plant now gives the animals better camouflage and self-defense against predators, it's now a mutualistic symbiosis. Over time, these animals will start to evolve whole-like structures in their skin to make sure that the plant has enough room to grow in, similar to the common Suriname toad. But what about the ferns that grow on Venusaur's back? Well, because their skin is so holy and suited for plants to grow in there, it should be pretty easy for ferns to grow in there as well. Of course, to make sure that the plants don't dig in too much and actively hurt the organs of the animal, they have all a thick internal skin, which basically neutralizes them. It's all due to their semi-aquatic behavior and, well, again, just luck that doing a little falls like this. And even though this evolution is very hyper-specific, like I mentioned earlier, I do believe it is somewhat plausible. 
perhaps somewhere in the far future. Besides, it took a lot of luck and five mass extinctions for us naked apes to be running around and basically ruling the world. Eventually, over time, a new genus of Triopelus is made. This will contain the Venusaur line and all its relatives, and it will be named Morticia Faraday, meaning Beast of Death in Latin, referring to the smell of the rotten flesh the flower possesses. One thing all the species in this genus have in common is having green algae, ferns, and reflecias on their back for camouflage, but they're all in unique patterns, along with various forms and sizes. Our focus will go to the species with the biggest reflecia, the Venusaur line, or as it's called now, the Morticia Therium, which the genus is named after. This flower will co-evolve with the animal by making its lifespan longer along with growing larger. This is to pollinate as much as it can now that it's being carried. They also evolve more sexual differences, so that the animals can recognize the sex of the flower and seeds. So every male will have male reflecia on its back, and vice versa. There's of course exceptions, but those are rare. Well, would you look at that? We actually did it! We made Venusaur real! Sure, the evolution was again very, very, very specific, but hey, it needs to be when you're working with Pokemon of all things. And in case you're wondering about the vines, it doesn't have any. Do you know how hard it would be to create this exact animal, but with six limbs instead of four? And no magical grass powers either. I feel like that's just self-explanatory. So yeah, I bet you didn't expect Venusaur to be this kind of weird mammal-like animal, but not really a mammal. You were probably expecting a frog or a reptile or something like that, but I got you there! Anyway, with that long chapter out of the way, let's actually have a look at the animal itself. Let's see how it lives, how it reproduces, and its role in the ecosystem. So we're finally here, in the home stretch. From a little Triassic Thoracid, we made the impossible happen and created a plausible scenario where a Pokemon like Venusaur could exist in real life. Through the magic of evolution. However, there's more to the new Morticia Therium than just looks. For example, mating. Uh, actually, let's start with the beginning of new life instead. But don't you worry, we'll get to the sexy mating in no time. I decided on giving them a gestation time of about eight months, around the same time as a hippo. Since this isn't an animal that ever existed, Determining its gestation is, of course, impossible, but we can compare it to a hippo, as it's around the size of one. Many animals that are oviviviparous, such as the basking shark, also have long gestation times, so it's not unrealistic it would have been pregnant for about eight months. Since they are so big, they only have one baby at a time, so they have enough time to show the kitten, and yes, I'm going to call their baby kittens, how to survive in the wild. These kittens are born without algae on them, so they just kind of look like weird bulbless brownish bulbasaurs. That of course changes when the mother puts the seeds of the reflecia and ferns in the kitten's back, and when the algae starts to grow. They now look kind of more like bulbasaur, but not completely, as I can't just, you know, put a cabbage on it. The mother usually gets food for the kitten in the beginning of its life, but over time it teaches the kitten how to hunt and eat on its own. Eventually, after a few months, it reaches its sub-adult stage, where it's not a baby anymore, but not really an adult yet either, and this starts to resemble Ivysaur. It's gotten bigger overall, its teeth are more developed, and its ears have folded out. The butt of the Reflecia has finally emerged, and the ferns have also began to grow and are visible. At the beginning of this stage, it may look like an odd Bulbasaur, but later when the flower begins to open, it'll look more like Ivysaur. It can defend itself now, and hunt for its own food, however, it prefers to stay with its mom. If it's a female, it can stay within the group and its mother, however, if it's a male, it's gonna have to survive on its own. This is to avoid inbreeding and, because, these animals live in a matriarch. I mean, come on, with a name like Venus or I can't resist. They stick together because safety, after all, is in numbers. They do communicate when there's danger, though, and some mothers do help out other kittens, but it's not very common. But what about the males? Well, they're usually more solitary and live on their own, but because they're more bulkier and more aggressive than the females generally are, they can survive just fine on their own. Eventually, over time, these animals will finally reach adulthood, and with that, they look just like Venusaur, of course as closely as real life allows. Along with that, their flowers have finally bloomed, and it's stinking real nicely to attract other members. Yep, it's breeding time. Around this time, various males show up, and they fight for dominance to see who gets to win the female and spread his genes. 
And after that, the gestation period begins anew, and the cycle of life repeats. But of course, that's not all, because now the Rafflesia has a really good chance to pollinate, as various insects show around to help it. And with all those insects around, they're probably going to start bumping uglies too. So basically, the whole place at this point will be a freaking breeding frenzy. Unfortunately though, after this breeding process, these animals don't really look like Venusaur anymore. You see, the plant dies after pollinating, becomes rotten, and just falls off the animal. I just can't let this plant bloom forever. I don't even know if that's possible. But if it did, it would likely just take over the whole forest. Luckily though, the life cycle of the Rafflesia perfectly aligns with the birth of a new kitten. So when growing up, a kitten will always resemble Bulbasaur and Ivysaur. Don't worry though, the animal doesn't die, they just replant the seeds of the Rafflesia in their backs, often helping each other with it. So yeah, their role in the ecosystem is a pretty cool one. One thing that I can't forget to mention though is that they are also omnivores. So they basically eat anything that's fallen to them. So another role that they have in the ecosystem is eating various organisms to control their population. Despite their success as a species, they never overpopulate the forest. Having only one offspring over the course of a long time can leave them vulnerable to really big predators, and trust me, they will eat them if they get the chance. And that keeps a good balance. That's just nature, and everything fulfills a niche. In conclusion, these animals sure are a strange bunch, displaying a very unique level of symbiosis. Promoting breeding for other animals, eating about anything, and keeping this German rainforest really special and really diverse. But will that continue until the present day? Well, I'll let you all draw your own conclusions on that. Phew! That was a lot. That was a lot. We finally did it though, buddy. We finally freaking did it! That was a lot of work, y'all. Trust me. I am so freaking freaking happy that I finally managed to actually turn this into a video instead of like a permanent side project. Next up will be Charizard, and this lizard will surely be interesting to try and recreate in real life. After that, it will be Blastoise, and after that, well, I honestly don't know. But what do you, the viewers, want to see? Comment down below. In case you're interested in more Pokemon and Paleontology combined, I recommend checking out my Paleoon series, where I discuss fossil Pokemon, or my video about Dreepy, where I discuss its prehistoric origins. And trust me, I have way more videos in the works that combines Pokemon and Paleontology and Biology, so there's lots to look forward to. Anyway, that was the video. I'm sure it's gone long enough by now, so please let me know what you thought of it in the comments down below. As always, if you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more Pokemon awesomeness, and don't forget to hit that little bell. In case you want to help support the channel even more, consider checking out my Patreon. I got pretty sweet rewards for low prices. And last but not least, I also have a Discord server in case you want to come say hi to me. Both my Patreon and my Discord are in the description below. And with that being said, I hope y'all have a good day, night, or morning, and as always, take care!